Okay, let's uh, get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Alex Vine from uh, UC Berkeley. Um, he was educated in France at uh, called Polytechnique uh, and also at Stanford. Um, he's been uh, he was an assistant professor at uh, in civil engineering at UC Berkeley and uh, was promoted to associate professor in 2010. He's won a variety of awards, including an SF career um, and his. Uh, you might, might have seen in the popular media some one of his projects, this uh, Mobile Millennium Project, and I think he's going to talk uh, more about uh, some parts of that project today. And without <coughs> further ado, welcome. Thank you very much for the uh, very generous introduction. It's very nice to be here. I come to uh, Illinois every couple of years, and every time it's nice to see some, uh, whoops, okay, that means I have a cell phone in my pocket, and the mic is not going to like that. Um, and I'll uh, just take that one as well. Um, and so, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna empty my pockets, but that's where we're gonna start today. Um, so, uh, can you hear me well now? Yeah. Good. So, uh, so I want to express my thanks to the organizers, uh, um, particularly Dan Work, for um, um, nominating me for the talk. So today, I'm going to um, do the talk in two parts, and specifically, what I'm gonna do is first give you some sense of uh, what we're doing with smartphones, and, and this is very applied, and there is going to be a lot of hidden theory behind that I'm not going to have time to describe in detail. Uh, but then in the second part, I'm going to dive into something a likely more theoretical, which is still very upstream of implementation, but kind of shows you where we are and where we're going. So the general topic of what we are interested in is large-scale infrastructure systems. And I think that uh, a lot of the technological developments we've seen in the last years have uh, significantly changed paradigms in the way people do smart structure monitoring or air quality monitoring in urban environments, um, distribution of water, obviously traffic, smart grids, smart buildings. Uh, this has drastically impacted our lives in many ways. We've heard about this through the previous talks. In the specific case of transportation, I think what was quite striking is um, if you think about traffic monitoring in 2008 and today, it's a radically different world. And mainly because at the time, most of the uh, infrastructure which was at our disposal for uh, this were embedded in the pavement, very hardcore, 30, 40 years old technology, maybe a little bit more modern version here, uh, cameras, fast track, and stuff like this. And this was very partial. Now, of course, in the last four years, we've, and I love to show this, I got this from Jim Sporer at IBM. Um, I think you, you see the, 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 in log scale, the increase of mobile devices. What's really cool is the Android phones I mean, that were um, reaching the uh, 1 million uh, per year. Actually, I was talking with Brian McClendon, the VP of Geo at Google, and now they're at 1.3 million. Uh, so it's, it's unbelievable um, how the scales have changed things. And of course, the, one of the first beneficiaries of that revolution is the mobile um, internet applied to traffic. And so uh, these um, two graphs kind of show you the steps achieved in the last four years, uh, not only in our research group, but I guess in, in the technology world in general, uh, this, actually, if you go to 511.org, you, you will still see this. So even though it looks now like a vintage website, it is actually still there. Uh, but I think anybody who has used um, traffic.com, Google traffic, Bing traffic, uh, Inrix traffic is used to this. Now, where did that come from? Well, that came from the mobile internet, and that's the first part of the story I want to, 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 to tell today. So the, the way I um, orchestrated that talk is first to tell you a little bit about the Mobile Millennium Project and, and what it does and, and what it did at the time and where, why it led us to where we are today. Um, and also explain a little bit about what we do with the crowdsourcing data because we get a fair amount of data and you know, a lot of it is garbage and, and so you have to be able to deal with garbage uh, efficiently and that's part of what we've been doing and very motivating when you tell students if you work in my group, you'll be dealing with garbage. Um, and, uh, and, then, um, uh, and so this is really my to production. I mean, I think every major company who is working in this field today has either hired our student, hired us, uh, taken our algorithms, or done it jointly with us. And I think that's, that's fairly mature. Um, and this is going to be more tentative in the sense that, okay, now that we have all this information, there's a lot of things you can do with it. Uh, so what are we going to do with it? So what is Mobile Millennium? Mobile Millennium was the first traffic app ever deployed in North America. Um, to gather traffic information on um, phones equipped with GPS and that run on all the Symbian and all the RIM phones. Um, it was launched in 2008 jointly by Berkeley and Nokia. Obviously at the time Nokia was a big player in the Symbian world. Um, at the time we had 5,000 downloads which was enormous. Um, remember this is before uh, there was an iPhone with a GPS. Android didn't even exist. There was no App Store. So the scales were very different. 
were running exclusively in the Bay Area. But fairly rapidly, we realized that you know, with the expansion of the iPhone and the fact that you know, the App Store today contains more like 600,000 apps, um, as a university, we should not be in the business of competing with the private sector to deploy apps. So we moved to a brokering model where instead of having our own cool little UC Berkeley app uh, running there, we just uh, gathered data from a lot of providers. And today our system gathers about 60 million GPS points every day um, from various sources. If you have an AT&T or Sprint phone and you're running the navigator, we get your data because it's collected by a company called Telenav. Um, if you, um, any FedEx truck or any UPS trucks that has, a, um, uh, that is hooked to the uh, Navtex system, we get that data as well. And so that's where the 60 million GPS points come uh, today. We've terminated our application because, I mean, we proved it, we, we, we designed it, we did a lot of research on it, and at some point it moved to the private sector. And so today what we have is we have this back-end system, which we built at the time as well, um, that collects all this data, blends it with a lot of other data that I'm going to show, and then broadcast the traffic um, in real time. And we've expanded the system to other cities as well. Um, we're running live in Stockholm now on the seven major axes. They're called the seven routes of Stockholm. Uh, we're about to launch uh, um, another new initiative with IBM Singapore. Um, and there's many more, th more things that we can do. Singapore is very exciting because they have 27,000 taxis linked in real time. And you can imagine, given the size of the island, that's a lot of uh, traffic monitoring opportunities there. So how did it start? Uh, let me just dive a little bit back in history, and I think it will uh, bring back good memories to Dan Work, who is here, because he was one of the main um, uh, contributors and instigator of that project. Um, so we started with an experiment, and mo do you hear this back noise here? So uh, I'm not sure what I have to do here. Uh, how is that? Is that better? Yeah. That's better? Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, well, <laughs> I'm not sure. All right. I'm going to try the Eric Ferrand technique, like yelling at people. Is that, is that, are you yeah, gonna, I think they're recording the lecture. Oh, they're recording the lecture. Okay, so, um, okay, so I guess I won't be uh, sued for patent infringement by yelling like you usually do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love it. Okay, so, uh, well, if that gets too annoying, then we can all gather and have more family-style uh, gathering here. Um, so, uh, it was pretty difficult to convince the Departments of Transportation to buy into this, and that's mainly because there had been 10 years of research leading to success of failures, uh, successive failures um, uh, in, in trying to do this for various reasons. Um, so we had to prove that the concept worked in 2008. Remember, this has not been done before. And we did it kind of the brute force way. That means basically renting 100 cars, hiring 200 students, 165 of which being um, um, uh, drivers and the other ones being monitors of the whole thing, and have them drive for 10 hours back and forth uh, here. And, and that's basically 2 to 5% of traffic if you factor this in with the regular traffic. And th that number was chosen very carefully because that was the forecast penetration of phones 18 months from 2008, which was the interest of Nokia at the time. Um, so we deployed teams of students on the bridges to monitor this with a high resolution video camera so you could uh, record the um, uh, license plate numbers of all the vehicles, not just our vehicles, um, re-identify them and that would give you an alternate so uh, source of data for ver verification uh, by basically using uh, license plates. In fact, in the process of setting this up, the student almost got arrested by the police because uh, he uh, showed up on the bridge on a rainy day with a hood and then uh, people started calling the police saying there's some kind of terrorist activity on the bridge. Um, so uh, the police told him that uh, if he wanted to do this again, uh, he had to wear, wear an orange vest and a helmet, um, which he did the next day, so nobody called. And so the conclusion of this is anything you want to do on a bridge, wherever, just wear the proper equipment, and, you know, like, you're going to be fine. So, um, the, in fact, this is the um, equipment. They didn't, they, they didn't want to put the helmet on the picture, but they had a helmet. Um, so it looks a real hardcore civil engineer, even though the guy's actually an electrical engineer. Um, so um, they probably wanted to be a civil engineer. So um, th this is what the experiment looked like. Uh, it was uh, pretty fun. Um, and uh, we held a press conference um, uh, while we were running the event. This is what you would have seen from a helicopter if you had been um, look overlooking what happened. Each of the dots is one of the vehicles with the color representing the speed. Um, the CTO from Nokia and the director of Caltrans um, came. Uh, we give a press conference uh, with the press. Um, this is probably the first historical reconstruction of traffic live from exclusively cell phones. Uh, at that time, we just did 10 miles. Um, in fact, we kind of had a little bit of a panic uh, at some point in the experiment because the journalists were all there. And uh, there was this uh, big patch of red here, which uh, means traffic jam. And uh, this is roughly where we were on the map. And people just didn't believe there was a traffic jam at 10.30 AM. Um, in fact, that woman here works at traffic.com. And what she's doing on the picture is she's calling traffic.com for traffic report uh, to check if the Berkeley algorithms was working well. Um, and it turned out that uh, there was a five-car pileup accident. And we caught it before um, the police and the 
the CHP. And so, of course, when we figured out that the traffic was actually correct, it was very good. And the rumor since has been that we created the accident uh, on purpose to, um, to basically uh, demonstrate the technology. And I cannot comment on this. Um, but I can say that these rumors probably came from Stanford. Um, so, um, the, uh, so, okay, this was all very cool. And what we decided to do next is to build a production system. Um, in fact, we rebuilt it three times over the next two years because building a production system is very hard. And so in, this morning we heard, no, actually we heard how many lines of code? 6.9 million? 5.6 million. Yeah, so this is 15 million lines of code. That probably means that we're not very good coders. We could do this uh, and it was smaller. But I mean, this is what it takes to build a production system with a professional database. So it's not flying an aircraft. Now, obviously this runs on the cloud and this is much bigger. But this is what it took. This is the architecture it took to actually build a system that can replicate what Google Map does at the scale of California. And so this has a bunch of feeds you can't read, but basically it says taxi feed, uh, phone feed, uh, Navtech radar feed, Bluetooth feed. So all these feeds go into a database which uh, basically has a bunch of filters, and that's really basic filtering. And these go into models that have an estimation wrapper around it. So think about it as extensions of Kalman filtering on nonlinear models. Um, and basically, generation of information that goes to other feeds. We feed back to Nokia, to, um, um, to Navtech, and to a lot of different companies we work with. Um, and so this has been basically what we have operated at Berkeley since 2009. It was launched in 2009. We rebuilt it several times, and it's been live since. This is an example of what the data looks like. This is about half a percent of the uh, data we collect. Uh, this is specifically all the taxis of San Francisco. Uh, each of them sampled at a one minute uh, interval. Uh, and what's pretty nice is you can see just with this small fleet of 500 vehicles, you can already uh, gather um, a lot of information. This is not enough to do traffic live in everywhere in the city, but you can you certainly have enough traffic in the financial district um, to do a lot of very good uh, work on, on our trail um, uh, traffic here. This is what you get after a whole day of collecting the data. Um, you can see the data is, is fairly nice. You can even see a lot of the landscape. A lot of the students actually work on feature detection. Is like how do you use this to infer features in maps? It's something which is extremely interesting for companies today. If you go to places like India or uh, other places in the world, there is very few attributes in the maps. Uh, but attributes can be inferred from this data. For example, here you can see there's the international terminal because there's GPS occlusion. And these types of things are actually very helpful uh, to complete maps. And that's also something we work on, even though that's more peripheral interest in the project. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two things we do with this data and not go too deep in the theory. And, then be, and that's more mature things that we published um, in the last couple of years that is now being used in industry. Uh, and then we're going to go deeper into some of the math we do for the more new things that we're interested in working on. So the one thing which is interesting with probe data is there's a lot of garbage. And this is an example of what the garbage looks like. So if you look at the trajectory of a taxi in a city like San Francisco, uh, sampled at one minute, um, taxi can go up to seven blocks um, in one minute. Um, and typically, so if the taxi is going slow because there's congestion, it's not going to be too bad. But at some point, um, something's going to happen where the GPS error is such that you project the taxi on the wrong road. And anybody who has done map matching has done this. It's just inevitable. And if you just do nearest neighbor map matching, what's going to happen is you're going to predict that the taxi goes this way. And a lot of really bad things can happen because now that means the taxi will do a lot of other bad things, including going backwards. So here's an example of a taxi stopped at a, a traffic light or stop sign. And because of noise, basically, the next point is actually behind the first point. And that happens quite frequently. And this, is, this, is, this probably happened on the data sets I've seen. This probably happens, I don't know, maybe 50 times a minute or, 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 or at least. So then, you would, then a typical map matching algorithm would induce a solution where you think the taxi is going around the block. So you can see already, I mean, this data is extremely difficult to use. Um, uh, urban canyoning is a reality. A GPS in a phone like this costs about $1, because okay, this is mass production and it's really crappy. So you cannot expect that you're going to have good data. And so the typical machine learning algorithms that we create to fix this, and I'm not going to go too deep here, um, uh, they operate like this. You can't really see the network here. It's a pity. Um, but basically, imagine a Manha Manhattan grid in the back here. So you get raw data. And because you have two directions, because you have two directions or two um, uh, north, south, east, west, and then bi-directional on each. You have technically eight projections. 
um, for every point you do. So now to go from here to here, technically you have an infinite number of um, uh, possibilities, but if you do shortest path and you limit it by the speed, basically you can reduce the number of actual feasible path to a certain number. And then with some filtering algorithms where you have a hidden Markov uh, process where you don't know the routing, you can put probabilities onto the uh, different routes that the taxi has taken and then assign these probabilities to some travel time. And so this is an example, a uh, very high level, of an algorithm that you have to use if you want to transform this, which will project straight from the lobby of a building to the middle of another block into something where you map it into some travel time. So that's the first example of, of high level algorithms that you have to do to process this data. There is another approach which was um, launched by Nokia in 2007, right before we started that project. And that approach was basically very much inspired by privacy preserving architectures. And I think at that time the problem was people had a big distrust for trajectory sampling. They were saying, I mean, there's all these very nice studies coming out of Microsoft showing that, and I, I think that's uh, Horowitz, Kroom, and a lot of other people um, are showing that even with anonymization, uh, it's very easy to re-identify people by correlating with other fields. And so part of the interest that was generated at Microsoft led to the creation of a new sampling architecture um, in, in which basically we wanted to move away from these types of sampling, these type of sampling being basically every second my phone sends some data and that's really great, right? Because you can see all the traffic light violations. Um, you can also probably see where the person lives because at some point he's gonna park in someone else's garage. Um, and then uh, you can also see the speed violation and a bunch of other things. So the point is, uh, at that time we thought this type of data um, is really going to freak people out and people won't want to share it. Um, turns out, I mean, 2012, nobody cares, but, um, uh, and you know, everybody was click yes, 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 on whatever form they brought, or sending that data to Google, to Facebook, to a lot of companies anyway. But in order to create an architecture that actually can move away from that kind of sampling paradigm, what uh, we came up with, uh, Nokia, and Nokia patented this, was the concept of a virtual trip line, which is basically a form of an electronic portal defined by a geographic marker, so it's GPS coordinates, um, that uh, probabilistically trigger a phone update when a phone crosses them. And so the way it works is these are deployed in the um, map. You don't see it, it's embedded in the map. And then when the phone crosses it, it will probabilistically send an update. And typically, if you encrypt this, and if you anonymize the data, then you reduce enormously the amount of uh, risk or threat that one might experience uh, when sharing their data. And so the way it works is uh, when the phone is uh, moving in the network, it queries the database. The database contains a lot of different things, like all the ties and all the stuff you see on the map. Uh, but it also contains this, which you cannot see, which are the virtual trip lines. So now, because the phone is location aware, whenever it's gonna cross a virtual trip line, um, it's gonna send an update, which is probabilistic, saying the location of the trip line, not the location of the vehicle, um, the speed, and maybe a couple other things. And if you do this probabilistically, and if the penetration of the vehicle is high enough that you can sample uh, in a way that you cannot re-identify, so you don't sample someone all the time, uh, then you can show that you, you can do a lot of pres privacy preserving operations that are not threatening people's privacy. And I shamelessly stole that slide from, from that. So, um, other th so this is typically what you have to do or what you m want to do with, uh, with data to, to, to filter code the garbage. Uh, nice way about, the nice way to think about this is that when you do this, you don't have really a problem of localization as much because now you're detecting a crossing, which is much easier than detecting a location and your projection. Of course, there's issues of directionality that have, been sol that have to be solved in the problem. I'm gonna briefly present an other algorithm that is used to filter that data before we dive a bit deeper into the theory. Uh, and that's an ensemble common filtering algorithm that we use on a nonlinear dynamics model for the, um, for the uh, uh, traffic we deal with. So if you think about the um, reconstruction of traffic, people always think about prediction, but even before you can think about prediction, uh, forecast, and the problem of now cast estimation is actually a very hard problem in traffic. You can't really see here the quality of the projector is not great, but um, so <coughs> the problem of now cast is simple to formulate. You have a road with a lot of vehicles, some of them sending some position, and what you're doing is you're sampling in time space the trajectory. So in essence, what you're doing is you're sampling a surface in time space, um, and if you're trying to reconstruct the whole surface up to now, that's now cast, and if you try to um, uh, predict what the surface will do, that's forecast, okay? So I'm gonna show how we do now cast, and now cast 
is, again, difficult. And if you're not convinced, you should go to Chicago and try to run INRIX traffic and Google traffic and a couple other traffic maps. First, you're going to see three results which are different, and probably none of them is going to agree with your traffic because traffic is inherently extremely difficult. Um, and so here's one way to do it, which hopefully um, alleviates a lot of the difficulties we've seen um, in uh, traffic estimation. And again, you know, it, people always ask us, how accurate are you? And the answer to that is, well, you can't really measure accuracy because travel time is a distribution and so on. But here's a, a way to try to at least converge to things which, which look like um, the real world. So if you want to model traffic, a um, good way to do that is to use a mass conservation in which the density of vehicles is modeled by a row, and um, you're trying to model traffic jams by the evolution of that density. Q is called a flux function. I'll show it in a minute. Um, that's a first order hyperbolic PDE. Um, so it's very nasty. It has shock. Its solution lives in BV. Um, so nasty functional space. And furthermore, you have to use uh, weak boundary conditions, which are really hard. That means you cannot control things in a strong sense. And that's very hard. That has also led to a lot of mistakes in the controls literature because it's not, you cannot control things in a strong sense. So even though you impose something, it doesn't mean the system will actually do it. Um, this mysterious flux function Q was measured for the first time in 1935 by Greenshield in Ohio. I also sh stole that shamelessly from Dan. Um, and it basically relates the density to the flux, and it's fairly intuitive. The more people, the more flux, and at some point the flux goes down. Green Shields in 1935 modeled this as a um, parabola. Um, more standard way of modeling this today is triangular. Comes with its challenges because it's not smooth here, but okay, let's put this below the carpet for now. So um, with that Q function, now you have a fully prescribed model. You can't do anything with it because it's very hard to come up with uh, analytical solution to that model, but so you have to discretize it. To discretize it, you have to use a typical um, finite different scheme. The good enough scheme was invented in 1957. It does a fairly good job at capturing all the features you want for traffic. Um, it comes with this operator here, which is nasty because it's not linear and it has min max in it, so it's not differentiable. That means later on you won't be able to use extended Kalman filtering, you'll have to use something else. Um, but that gives you an evolution equation of the density on the grid. So if you know the density on the grid i at time n, you can compute it in a nonlinear manner at time n plus 1. And now that is a um, nonlinear dynamical system. Then there's a whole process that we have to go through, which uh, basically maps density into velocity. The problem is a cell phone can measure velocity. Okay, it knows how fast you're going. But it cannot measure density, because it doesn't know how many vehicles are around you. So you can't measure the state. That's a problem. So it, there's a lot of things that can be done about it. In fact, Dan is doing a lot of research on this now um, uh, as part of his new agenda. But um, at the time, what we decided is to switch the state to speed, because that's the only thing we could measure. And so there's a lot of problems doing this, but that can be done. Um, there's problem of existence and uniqueness. In some conditions, you can show the equivalence of the two formulations. And if you do, and you discretize the transformation, then you end up with a dynamical system in which the state now is the speed of the freeway and not the density of the freeway. Um, and there is an evolution equation for it. So basically, at each of the cells, you have a value of the speed, which depends on time. And the evolution of the state is actually super nasty. Uh, so the, don't even try to uh, understand what each of the terms here means. But the, the point here is that that evolution is nonlinear, non-differentiable. Um, and it includes a lot of nasty features, such as these good enough fluxes, which are inverted with respect to the final model diagram, which is the concave flux function I've shown before. So regardless of the details here, the point is, OK, we're going to do estimation on this. This is nonlinear. This is non-smooth. So any of the typical Kalman filtering or extensions of Kalman filtering that we're used with, to, to deal with uh, are not going to work, um, despite the fact that here the measurement equation is actually quite simple because you do measure the speed in each of the cells, so you have a linear measurement equation, which is kind of a nice feature here. Um, and so the way we do this is with ensemble Kalman filtering, which I'm summarizing here very <laughs> simply. So you can't use Kalman filtering, so you use ensemble Kalman filter um, with measurement updates which are linear. Um, and the beauty of this is that all you need to do in the ensemble Kalman filtering approach is to have a statistical forecast 
in the forecast step of the Kalman filtering. In other words, you have a bunch of ensemble members, uh, which is a collection of um, models. You forward them um, uh, one step forward in, in time, and that's how you compute your covariance and so on. And so that's a fairly standard thing that um, is done in, um, in fact, weather forecast. It's probably the most standard uh, technique used in weather forecast. I'm summarizing the equations here. Again, the point here is not to go deep in, in, in them, but just to realize that because you have this nonlinear update equation, what you do is you propagate it um, m times, where m is the number of ensemble members. Okay, so if you're used to particle filtering, I mean, in a sense, it's the uh, same idea of having all these particles. Um, and that's what you use to compute your average and your covariance matrix. And then you can use the standard Kalman equations based on the computation of these matrices. Okay? So that's a fairly standard thing um, that um, um, we've uh, uh, implemented. Uh, and that was really the first approach we, we used to, for traffic uh, now cast. And um, um, it's been fairly efficient and has worked quite well um, over the years. So to show you how it works in practice, this is what you get at 2% penetration rate um, when you collect uh, smartphone data. Each of the dots here is one GPS point of a vehicle sending you the data every three, three seconds. So it's a fair assumption to assume that Google today and a lot of these companies are sampling this. I mean, in 2008 they didn't uh, for various reasons. The phones were not there, the penetration were not there. I mean, a major company like Google today would probably have data of that size. I don't know this officially. I've never looked officially at Google's data, but I think it's a good assumption to make. Um, and so, of course, that's data that we measured in 2008, um, uh, but that will give you an, an idea of what can be done today with your phones, basically. Um, and you can see the data is fairly accurate. I mean, it's, uh, you can see someone moving at about 65 miles an hour. This is coast mile, this is time, getting into this mega traffic jam I was telling you about, and then driving further. So, for example, if you decimated that data and decided, okay, let's assume I'm going to just measure VTL data, like I should before, that's what it would look like. Okay, so this is the same data set, I've just decimated it, and now is, imagine I have these markers, and all I do is I sample a proportion of the vehicles as they drive by, that's what I get. Okay, so um, uh, in a sense, if you do have all this data, you probably don't really care um, um, how much um, how much uh, uh, to downsample. You can practically see traffic. Here you, you can't. And so this is the reconstruction you would obtain after the downsampling. Okay? So it's pretty, um, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty nice because if I just flip this, you can see that um, you can see the model does a fairly nice reconstruction. Um, you can do the L2 error analysis and we've done that. And I think that's just very uh, pleasant because it shows that this flow model was performs quite well and the uh, estimation technique is quite efficient. So people always ask us when we start, you know, how are you different from Google? Um, so at some point uh, we decided to even shoot a movie to compare our stuff to Google um, because the answer while well, we're doing the same was not a satisfying answer to um, our sponsors. Um, and so um, I think what was nice at the time is that uh, because we had these algorithms and they were running so fast, we were actually about 15 minutes faster than Google in providing our forecast. Uh, you can see this is our traffic, it's accelerated. You can see there's going to be a traffic jam happening here quite soon. Uh, it's happening right now. Uh, and it's going to take about 15 minutes for uh, the Google traffic at the time to, uh, to produce the same thing. Now, of course, Again, this is 2009, and there's 500 people working at Google Maps and probably a dozen in, in traffic. So uh, now things are very different. But I think this was very satisfying to us because we had a lot of way to validate our approach against state-of-the-art um, traffic. And I do consider Google state-of-the-art. I think they are the leading provider of traffic today. Um, and uh, and uh, so being able to do that comparison was actually fairly good. So um, of course, I think where we are going out with this is we're interested in probe data. We were among the first ones to tackle probe data at a large scale. Um, today we have an engine which can fuse anything from probe data to aftermarket data, to taxi data, to RFID data, um, uh, radar, loop, camera. And we even can fuse uh, data collected from UAVs. The US um, Army um, sends planes to monitor traffic, um, not in the US, but in other countries. Um, to follow specific uh, POS, like people of interest. Um, and so, uh, but we can also use it for traffic. Um, and the data sets we get are for the US, so it's interesting. Um, or we even have uh, reprogrammed the satellite. Uh, the German DLR has a satellite, which, or which a low orbit satellite, which um, uh, they have reprogrammed to orbit uh, um, above California, that way we could collect uh, California data. So all these data we can, we can fuse, and that's part of what you know, this mega system I've shown before um, does. 
With that, we've done lots of different things with my colleague Edmund Seto. We've worked on uh, producing noise levels uh, for cities like San Francisco. Today, um, <coughs> it's extremely difficult for the city to uh, produce noise levels. And what they do is they send people to the intersections to count turns and vehicle movement. And they average this over one day. They assume that it's going to be the same the whole year long. And that's what they produce. And so what we did is try to do it hour by hour um, uh, using uh, that data that was quite good. Other things we've done is to um, uh, use this to predict pollution emissions around the freeways um, and um, started to see how um, smartphone data could be used um, to provide additional measurements. In fact, NASA is already working on some uh, air quality sensors. And you know, it's not completely crazy that in a couple years, these will have air quality sensors as well. OK, so this is kind of the end of the very first part, the, the first part of the talk. This is kind of the summary slide of what we've done. Um, and that kind of summarizes you know, the, 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 the scope of the project. We started in 2008 as an experiment that was Mobile Century. Um, we launched a pilot with Nokia where anybody could download a phone app that was, the, as I said, the first one <coughs> launched in the US to run on Symbian. And over the years, I, I think we can probably say we have worked with practically everybody in the field who um, works on traffic. You can see all these companies. Um, I think what's very nice is that it all these are these these are, this set of companies contains all the major players who produce traffic information in the U.S. I mean, if you're a major player, except maybe Inrix, um, you, you're you're there. And we have worked with practically all of them either because they funded our project, or because they partnered with us, or because they used our algorithms, um, or because they hired our students, or because now they want to use our algorithms to migrate them. And because a lot of the Nokia people now went to Microsoft, we end up working with Microsoft. So um, so it's very it's fairly nice because. Um, I think it's very reassuring for us to see that all the things we've done has made it to industry, um, despite the fact that when we started it, it was not that clear that it would ever have uh, relevance. So now I'm going to show about something which is a lot more tentative. Um, and um, um, I would say uh, we're back to where we were in 2007. In 2007, people were wondering, OK, we're, we're going to have all these phones. What are we going to do with it? So now we have all these phones. We have all this information. So the question is, what are we going to do with it? And an interesting thing that you can do when you have this information is you can use to forecast what's going to happen. And you can try to use it to influence what people are going to do with that information. So if you think of it as a simple game that we are thinking to put together now, and you are trying to go, say, from San Francisco or Berkeley to uh, San Jose, um, practically four routes. Right? You could go 101. That's probably the fastest. You could go 280. That's probably the next fastest. You could go 880. And if you're really crazy, you could go behind the mountains and go 580. Um, and uh, so what it means is that modulo the switch you could do between the routes, which for now we're ignoring. This is a parallel network. Um, and so the question is, well, let's forget the industry perspective. Up to now, I was interested in wearing my industry hat. You know, I'm a traffic information provider. And I'm interested to provide good traffic information. So now take me my government hat and say, well, I'm the government, so now I'm interested in giving people incentives to use the network as efficiently as possible so I can maximize my whole throughput. And that's a new project we're starting with the California Department of Transportation. Uh, we have now a team of 50 people um, that are working on this, including a lot of the people from Caltrans, um, and, that, and that are trying to figure out how you allocate that traffic best so you operate the network optimally. So the, the question you're now solving is you have a certain flow R and you have a certain latency, the travel time, on each of the links. Um, and you're trying to maximize or minimize some metrics, so say minimize total travel time, uh, based on everybody's flows. The, the queues are the flows and, and latencies. Okay? So you know, you're the government. You're trying to make things as, um, as uh, uh, efficient as possible. And what can you do to improve this? Well, you can give people information. Technically, you could give people fake information, so they do what you know. Uh, like I say, like, this is faster this way, go this way. Um, um, or you could give them rewards, or you could have virtual games like Waze, where people are competing against each other to gain status. Um, you could do tolling. Um, you could do reverse tolling, which is incentivization. So with social networks, there's a lot of ways you can influence people. And the first one is to give people information, but you can go way beyond information. So the problem that we're going to solve is we're going to assume that we can influence a proportion alpha of people. So say, we can, we, can make peop we can make 5 percent of the people do something. So for example, take 280 instead of 101. 
And the question is, what would you have these people do given that the 95 remaining percent are going to be selfish and do whatever they want, so that overall the actuation of these five people provides the social optimum given that the other ones are going to be selfish. And that's kind of called the price of anarchy. That's basically the cost. Uh, so the price of anarchy is the cost of the Nash equilibrium, that's everybody being selfish, over the cost of the social optimum. It's like basically totalitarian state where you tell people what to do. Okay, so that's the price of anarchy. Um, so of course, the social optimum, unless you're in a dictatorial state, you can't achieve it because people are going to behave selfishly. So we're going to not be able to have the social optimum. We're going to have something a little less good, and that's a Stackelberg equilibrium. And that's basically saying that there are people you can influence. You know, if I give everybody a free cappuccino to leave the freeway, probably few people will do it. And if I give $1,000 to people to leave the freeway, people will probably do it, and I would do it. Um, so there is a middle point, and if you give enough money, people will start to do what you want. In fact, uh, they were joking that you know, if you're a student, if you pay enough, they will jump from the first floor. If you pay more, they'll jump from the second floor. And at some point, you need to stop paying because they'll keep jumping. <laughs> so, um, so here, let's not worry about the mechanism of how we get people to jump. Uh, but we assume that uh, there is a proportion that will jump. Okay? And so these will be the leaders. And then there's, uh, so they're the compliant people. They, they will do whatever you tell them to do. And uh, then there is the other guys, one minus alpha r, and they won't do. They'll just be selfish, OK? Um, so the, and they are sharing the network. So every arc, every edge, has a bunch of selfish guys and a bunch of altruistic guys, or guys who take the opportunity. And now you can play with the blue guys, and you're trying to make the blue guys do the thing that, so that overall, everybody's better off. You have a flow model on each of the links, and that's what I showed before. Little traffic, little flow, more traffic, more flow, and then more, more traffic, then less flow because of the congestion. So you have this flux function, density, and, and flux. And if you map that flux function in terms of travel time, well, it says as long as you don't have too many people on the freeway, everybody has more or less the same travel time, right? It's about two hour and a half to go to Chicago. And as long as the freeway doesn't get congested, whether there's one person, 10 person, or 100 people, usually everybody has the same tra travel time. But if you have more people, then the travel time is going to grow. And at some point, you might get infinite, because if you have too many people, you just clog the freeway. Uh, and if you, f if you map this in terms of flux and latency, what that means is here's density and latency. So small density, small travel time, big density, well, bigger travel time. Now, remember, for one flux, there's two densities, right? Because this is uncongested, and this is congested. That means if you map the latency as a function of the flux, you have two values. It's a multi-valued function. That corresponds to the uncongested state, and that corresponds to the congested state. M equals 1 means congested. M equals 0 means uncongested. So that, uh, you have to understand this, because otherwise the rest of the talk will be incomprehensible. So again, what that means is, if I map the travel time as a function of the flux, um, for up to a certain flux, it's the same travel time. And when traffic jams start to happen, the, tr the flux starts to decrease, and the travel time starts to increase. Okay. So that's the flow model. That's the static flow model on each of the links. OK? That's um, so a way to say it mathematically is basically you call AN the free flow travel time. Uh, that means zero congestion. And then uh, if it's congested, there's one congestion, then you're on that branch. Okay. So first, let's look at the Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium means everybody's using the network. Everybody's selfish. And so we're not going to be able to reach the social optimum. So what does a Nash equilibrium look like? In the Nash equilibrium, which is what happens to everybody here every day, you don't have an incentive to switch your route. That means you're acting selfishly, and you, you shouldn't change, because you can only be worse off. So what that means is that if you look at these diagrams, I have one first highway, a second highway, a third highway, a fourth highway. And um, if I look at that first highway, there's a flux. If I look at the second highway, there's a flux. If I look at the third highway, there is a flux. But the point is, everybody has the same travel time. That's the definition of Nash. It means, basically, I don't have an incentive to switch from one freeway to another, because I'm equally bad on the other freeway. Okay? That's, that, that's what it means. So these are the fluxes. That means I have that much flux on the first uh, highway, that much on the second, and so on. And everybody has the same latency. So. The way these Nash, and this is happening on the freeway every day, basically. You know, if there's not many people, well, people will choose the fastest. And they will choose the fastest 
until you clog the fastest. Now that's the point where you clog the fastest. Now they will start to fill the second one, which is not as fast, because you can see the travel time is higher. And that means people on the first one are suffering. You know, the, the, the freeway is not operating at capacity anymore now. Um, it's reduced its capacity, okay? And then you clog the second one, then you go to the third one, okay? And this concept basically comes from Tim Rock Garden and the, all the internet congestion uh, literature, uh, except the, the latency functions in the internet are very different, but that's what it looks like in transport. What you can prove mathematically is that a Nash equilibrium has one of the two forms. Either um, there is one single link which is free flow, that means at least one of these guys is in free flow. These guys are sitting in traffic. This guy is driving 65 miles an hour. At the end, they still have the same travel time. It's just this guy is traveling a longer distance. Okay? That's one possibility. Or the other possibility is everybody is sitting in traffic, in which case the support of the set of the congested links um, is uh, going all the way to the link K, and anything above is empty, because you have no incentive to use a, a freeway which is longer. So that's the first thing you can prove. It's not, I mean, it, it's not rocket science, but you, can, it, you still need to prove it. And so that's very nice because that reduces the set of possible Nash equilibria to a polynomial number. In fact, it's linear. Um, it's not the case in internet congestion. Um, in fact, that's an NP-hard problem. But actually, in, um, in, uh, in the transportation setting, ironically, even though the um, latency function is uh, more complicated, it, it is a linear set of equilibria. And so what that means is that in your sorting of the equilibria that we will do soon, um, you only have to explore a linear set of equilibria, which is good, because that's going to give a polynomial time algorithm. This is just what I was explaining here. And so typically, the way you look at this is that anytime you have an equilibrium, you have congested links. And then you have, at most, one uncongested link. And that's the guy who choose to the, go, the guys who choose to go on the freeway go 65 miles an hour on a much longer freeway. And if you push um, the guy to, on the super fast freeway to the max, that's how you maximize the throughput without going even further and screwing people more. Okay? So that's saying, you know, if you push one more person beyond this point, everybody moves to the next level, and everybody suffers even more. OK? Um, so you can show that um, with this. Um, uh, you can show that with this type of analysis, um, there is a maximum throughput you can put in, uh, on the freeway. And at some point, you, if you push too many people on the freeway, you clog everything, and then you're dead. Um, but if you're below that uh, number, you can prove that you can always go down up to a certain point and find a situation in which the optimal solution to your Nash problem is such that at least one of the links is in free flow. Okay. That's another property you have to use. Um, and now your job as the government, I'm putting back my government hat on, uh, your job is to find among all these equilibria the best one. So among all the possible flow assignments, and there is at most two n of them, find the best one. So again, that's nice because that's polynomial time. You have um, uh, uh, only a linear uh, number of, uh, of um, equilibria. And so now what we're going to do with this is tackle drag routing. So up to now, everybody is selfish. So now we go back to the uh, setting to which we can influence 5% of the people, 3%, 10% of the people. These are the alphas. And now we're going to start routing them in a way that benefits everybody. And so what that means is what you need to do is exactly the same analysis, except now you have S. That's the flow of the people who do what you tell them to do. You have T of S, these are the other people, the selfish people. And you're trying to basically get the latency of everybody um, given the amount of congestion they induce. You can define an induced Nash equilibrium. The induced Nash equilibrium is the same definition as before. It's basically saying there's no incentive for anybody to switch. And if you're not uh, a used highway, there's a, a longer travel time. So you shouldn't use that highway. So a Stackelberg equilibria is basically an equilibrium in which you tell this alpha proportion to do um, something, and then the rest behave selfishly. You have an infinite amount of them. And so the role of the government is to basically find the best of them. And the best Stackelberg equilibrium is going to be among all the Stackelberg equilibria, so among all the equilibria in which 5% does what you tell them, 95% doesn't, Okay, you find the best possible way to do that. 
And it's very, it's interesting because now this goes back, if you go to the government, you can really explain them to them and that's very intuitive. The way to do that, the way to find that best equilibrium is to first compute what would happen if the good guys were not here. So if the good guys were not here, 95% of the people will do the selfish thing. You let them do their selfish thing, you look at what happens, and that's the best Nash equilibrium of the non-compliant people. Okay? Now that you know exactly what the selfish people do, um, what you do is basically you compute the strategy S that will induce it, and the way you do it is by filling the links that are not congested one by one by basically screwing over the people who are doing what you tell them to do, or that's why you need to reward them, but that way you don't further con uh, congest the links. So it's fairly simple. You let the selfish people do what they want, and then you ask the compliant people to do what's best to not further congest the links. So let me illustrate this graphically. That means this is what the selfish people do. Selfish people okay, just choose whatever flow they want to put in. So first guy, second guy, third guy. And everybody has the same latency. Okay, so they have already screwed themselves over in a sense that these two links are congested. They could do a much better job if they had done another assignment, but because they're selfish, um, uh, one guy is driving much longer at 65 miles an hour, and the two other flows of people are basically sitting in traffic. So now, instead of continuing to do this and raise that latency, what you do with the people who are good citizens is you fill the links until they saturate, but then instead of pushing this up, then you tell them, okay, now that you've saturated this link, don't push it further. Just go to the next route, drive longer distance at 65 miles an hour. So you're incurring a penalty, right? Because everybody here is equal, but you're not equal, right? You're suffering, you're, 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 you're having a longer time. Um, and then the next guy do the same until you've uh, basically exhausted all the flow. So you can see these guys, you need to reward them because they're, you know, they're being penalized. They have a much longer travel time. And so these are the compliant people. These are the leaders of the Stackelberg game. And then these are the followers of the Stackelberg game. And so now when you implement this in practice, what you need to do is you figure out your 5% of the people that you give a cappuccino to do whatever you want them to do. These are the blue guys. So you assign the blue guys directly to the rod you want them to go. And you can see why you have to pay them, right? Because if you're part of these guys, you're telling them, okay, you're gonna get a free cappuccino, and for this, what you need to do, don't take the first route, the second route, the third route, blah, 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 the nth route, take this one. So there, if this is number L, there's L minus one better routes for you. So we've gotta give you a reward to do this, okay? So you do this, you assign the blue guys, the compliant guys, and then you can trust the selfish people to do the right thing for themselves, you know? They're gonna assign themselves to the best they can do, okay? And so this, you know, this is where it becomes interesting to behavioral economists because now this is the price of time. Basically, if you want this to work in practice, you have to price this in a way that here you're gonna lose 30 minutes, so we need to give you money for whatever 30 minutes is worth to you. And this is where the work we've done stops and the work of the behavioral economic, uh, economists begin because the, the pricing and the mechanism design there is, 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 is not obvious. So you can prove that strategy is optimal um, and it's not a trivial proof, uh, but it's nice because the idea of how you build it is fairly intuitive. And you can even prove that the strategy is robust to some perturbation because it turns out that you can switch people from link to link. So even though you, know, you thought you need 5% to achieve this, if only 4% did it, it might still work. And that's mainly because you can see these blue guys here are very lucky. They're being given a reward, but actually they're getting to do the same thing as the selfish guys, right? I mean, so if everybody on the blue gets a cappuccino, well, not everybody's equal. This guy gets really bad time, but this guy gets really good time, and this guy gets actually to do, this guy gets paid to do the same thing as the selfish people. So that's where some robustness comes in, because if only four people, 4% 4 of the people did it, well, it would still work. It's just amounting to switch between selfish and non-selfish. So there is some robustness built into this, uh, which is uh, interesting. So how are we gonna measure this? Well, there's several metrics. I mean, one of them is called the price of stability, and the other one is called the value of altruism. And the names are kind of strange because they don't really match what these things do, but the price of stability is defined as the cost of um, what happens if you have a proportion alpha of people who do the right thing over 
what happens if everybody is doing the right thing, which is the social optimum. So that's called the price of stability. So this is what happens if you can control 5% of the people and they do the best for, the, uh, for society over what happens if everybody is doing the right thing. And then the value of altruism is kind of the opposite. It's what happens if everybody, uh, that's what happens if 5% of the people do the right thing over what happens if nobody cares. So it's like basically everybody behaves selfishly. Okay? So you can plot these two metrics and that's how you measure the relative success of these strategies. So going back to my example, so now we have uh, Oakland and San, and San Jose and there's four um, uh, different uh, alternatives. So 101 is roughly 60 minutes, 280 is 70 minutes, 880 is 80 minutes because you have to cross bridges, and then if you're crazy and go over the mountains, then well, it's longer. Okay, um, so here is, and this is a flow normalized by a factor 10. Okay, so this is, now we're gonna try to see how this works. Typically, when you plot for that specific network, what happens in terms of the demand and the compliance rate, the type of surface you get is as this. So this is demand, so zero is like nobody on the freeway, 1,500 is again normalized as maximum demand. Um, and then this is compliance rate, look here, nobody cares, so everybody's selfish. And here it's like totalitarian state. Everybody says what you they, they'll do whatever you say. So you can see, if you increase the demand, things are of course going to get worse. Um, it's not monotonic because you're computing the ratio over um, the, the the what happens with the fraction over the best thing that could happen. So this is not necessarily monotonically increasing this way, but it is monotonically increasing this way because here, the more you move this way, the less people care. Okay. So if you're here, people comply a lot and everything goes great. And then if you have less and less people comply, then things get worse. And what's interesting is you can see these jumps here. So it's not continuous, when there's jumps in that surface. And the jumps are due to the fact that at some point, if you add one more person to a situation, you have to open a new freeway, and now the travel time of everybody goes up. Okay? And so these are things that we're going to try to see if we can see in, in, in real life, because that means the travel time is really not increasing smoothly in that, in that context, and that's how you measure the relative efficiency of these strategies. And the value of altruism is just the almost, it's not the inverse, but it's similar to the inverse. So in, in that case, when the demand increases, then it goes down, because here what happens is you have the ratio of um, what happens when, um, uh, if I go back to my definition, um, uh, every, nobody cares versus 5% cares, okay? So if I go down here um, and uh, I'm here, that basically uh, means like here everybody cares. Um, uh, and so the ratio will be one. And then if you um, uh, go this way again, it's gonna decrease. So it's just a different way to look at the same result. So um, try to wrap this up because we're about five minutes from the end. We've done several things to, um, to, to figure out how that would ever be implemented. Uh, and it's not, I mean, we're at the age of social networks. We're at the age where, you know, companies like Waze have managed to get people to drive uh, significantly more than they need to just to grab status in a virtual game. Um, and it's pretty crazy, right? To write some goodies and get a super driver status in Waze, basically you're gonna drive more. Um, so one thing that we've done, and I'm gonna just show one minute um, demo, is we have tried to see um, how we could use the value of information to just change people's routes. So this is an example of an app we've put on the uh, App Store um, that gives you um, routes which change as traffic change to always maximize your probability of on-arrival time. So this is an example where you're not shooting for fastest, you're, choosi you're shooting for most reliable. And this is me just play the video really quickly. I'm Paul Borkov, developer of the iOS app, which allows drivers in the San Francisco Bay Area to try out the SOTA algorithm for themselves. This video was recorded live a few days ago. As you can see, I've picked the current location as my start point and chose an endpoint by dropping a pin on the map. A budget of five minutes is sufficient, and after a few seconds, the policy has been downloaded to my phone. Continue straight at the second intersection. Note that the first direction is announced to the driver immediately, and that we're not using street names, but rather the ordinality of the intersection when providing directions. This makes it easy for the driver to know when to turn without having to remember street names and seek out street signs. As soon as you reach the next intersection on the policy, the following direction is then announced. At this intersection, continue straight, then turn left at the third intersection. Next, here's an example of what happens when I end up driving slower than the policy expects due to congestion. I receive an oral alert notifying me of the change in directions along with the new direction, and the map will update to reflect the change in the route. Your route has changed.
The new direction is to continue straight at the third intersection. As I approach my destination on the final leg of the route, the application informs me approximately how much distance is remaining. When I reach my destination, I'm informed how much time is still remaining in my budget. I hope you have enjoyed this short demo of our application, and thank you for your attention. We expect the reliable router app to launch... Okay, I just, no, all the rest is commercials, no, stop it. Um, so, um, okay, so let me, uh, let me just uh, conclude the talk um, uh, by uh, just showing one or two vignettes of what we're doing now. So we've just started that much, much bigger project now called the um, uh, Integrated uh, Corridor Management. And, you know, what the state of California has realized in that process is that they need to buy data. Um, and so what we've built for them, and the guy who built it is actually the guy who was speaking the demo, which I just played, is a tool to rate the data. You know, you're the state, you're going to buy millions and millions of GPS data points. You have to be able to figure out how reliable that is, how that changes throughout the day. So being able to say on the weekend there's not much data, on the day there's a lot of data, on the night there's not a lot of data, all these metrics. So we have built that tool and we have even pushed it further by having a procurement process uh, that we put together for them. So we're buying state, uh, we're buying data on behalf of the state, and that will be part of the bigger system we build to control traffic. The, the concept of the system is as follows. I mean, I think, you know, what we showed in the first part of the talk is that with a lot of data, you can monitor traffic. I think the next big thing, at least in California, is, well, now, how do you put this type of information and this type of incentives, you know, the free cappuccinos for the people who want to um, uh, uh, use them in a way that benefits society, with ramp metering where you actually actively prevent people from entering on the freeway to not clog the freeway, to changeable message signs by giving them information, which could be oh, a traffic jam because of a football match or could be a, a Groupon deal at, at Starbucks if you exit now. And so integrating all that is actually a fair amount of work and <clears throat> understanding the way to incentivize mode shift is quite difficult. Um, and that's not only mode shift in terms of your route, but could we even pe divert people onto the transit system. So we're building a decision support system, which is a superset of the system I've shown before, in which estimation, which is what we talked before, is only a small subset, because now you're putting humans in the loop, um, you're putting uh, decision modules, which you're gonna interact with hardware. I mean, we're arguing actually work on the physical traffic lights, um, and there's a whole uh, set of other questions that come with it. I mean, we heard about certification today from Eric, and there's many other uh, problems that come with it. I mean, the record to beat is, I think, TomTom -Tom created a seven hours gridlock in uh, the Netherlands by sending everybody through the shortest path a couple years ago. In China, there was a 100 kilometer uh, traffic jam. You heard about this, right, last summer. So we could try to beat that. Um, but I mean, so the point here is like, you have to be really careful, you know, when you, when you do these kinds of things. And that means, that it's not only a technical issue, it's really an institutional issue. Building a system like this means you have to have an app that you control very tightly. You need to work with the MPOs, the counties, the state agencies, potentially federal agencies, uh, the transit agencies. You need to also have a sensing infrastructure and you need to have industry partners because in general, um, you will want this to go in the Google apps or in any other app store of uh, an industry partner who has traction. And you know, in fact, we've worked very actively with IBM because places like Singapore, for example, are places where this thing could happen really fast. In particular, some of you have heard about ERP2, which is probably one of the most forward-looking um, um, uh, congestion incentivization um, um, uh, approach that, that I've heard in a long time. Um, we're also working with Waze um, to see how you can use the type of uh, information you collect from Waze. I mean, I kept the polite word here, but it's interesting when you look at everything which is uh, um, uh, posted on Waze, you, you get a lot of WTFs and things like this. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, uh, the text analytics will also change a lot the way things are done. And so um, uh, that notion of how social network can play a role in incentivization is quite interesting. Um, also to mention, cars are gonna be connected. Uh, the connected car, Consortium is probably one of the next big things that will happen. Um, this is completely obsolete. There's now 78 companies are part of this. Uh, and once the data starts streaming from the OBD2 at a large scale, we're gonna get a completely different way of dealing with traffic. So probably in 18 months, this will be the next big thing. I think right now it's just the um, incentive, but we are getting cars connected. I mean, self-driving cars is gonna happen in 10 years. But in the next 10 years, what you will see is connected cars uh, through the tablets, and this is really um, going to be a game changer, and that's something we're working on. Um, I want to give two more examples, and then I, I promise I stop. Um, one thing, we've seen driving phones, uh, we've seen talking phones, 
This is an example of a shaking phone. We have another project which is quite cool where we're using smartphones to monitor earthquakes. It doesn't quite happen here in Champaign, but uh, in California we have a lot of earthquakes. And so um, we've tested the 150 most famous earthquakes. I mean, earthquake engineers actually collect these um, uh, on the shake tables um, to see how a phone could be used to measure that uh, accurately. Um, and um, so it's not like in Star Trek where you move the camera to make it look like a chick. It, this is actually shaking for real. Um, and so uh, this is now something that seismologists are uh, working on with T-Mobile uh, to put this in the T-Mobile App Store uh, next year. And then the last application we're working on is uh, we've seen shaking phones. So that's a swimming phone. Um, and so it's basically we have built 100 of these. Uh, we have our little army or our, our little navy, I guess. And what we, we deploy um, on a semi-regular basis, 100 of these in the San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento Delta. Um, and well, first we tried them in the swimming pool at Berkeley. Um, but uh, this is another uh, interesting project in which just like Lagrangian sensing and traffic, what we're doing with this is we're able to reconstruct currents in real time. So you think about Google was probably the first provider of traffic information at a global scale on maps. Well, now we're doing this with water. And I think this is it. So um, again, I want to thank a lot of people who have worked on this. We have a very big team of uh, management and bachelor students. Uh, we have a professional software engineering team, and you don't build a 50 million lines of code system without professionals. I mean, Frankenstein designed by PhD students is not the way we wanted to go. Um, and, but most importantly, I really want to thank all the PhD students who have worked on this. I think there is a familiar face here. Dan, um, when you were a couple of years younger. Um, and, uh, and all the other PhD students who have uh, worked on this. So thank you again for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I think we're all dying to go to the receptions. But if you have questions, you can ask me now or around a glass of wine. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so this is very difficult. Um, and the answer is no, we have not done this. Um, as you noted, there is a very specific topology in the network we are um, uh, uh, studying, unfortunately. Right now, we are not uh, considering networks which don't have um, uh, non-parallel links. Everything I've said falls through, falls apart if you have a general topology. Um, it's not even clear, we're not even completely sure how to define equilibria when you start to have loops. Um, so this is just the infancy. Uh, and in particular, I want to stress out the fact that this would not work in practice because of the connectors you have here. And that's an open problem. And actually, that's a good time for me then to make an advertisement, which is that if you want to join our research group, we could have you work on this for people. And then since I've made one commercial, I could make a second one, which is we have a faculty position opened in smart cities. So if you're a PhD student who is just finishing the PhD, or if you're someone else who wants to join academia, please look at our website, uh, ce.berkeley.edu, because we have a faculty position open. And we'd love to see a lot of applicants doing control theory. <laughs> I, I'm not going to do any more shameless plug like this, I promise. <laughs> I'll really answer your, 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 your question. At CMU, there is a PhD student just finishing. So she's doing this unique mapping from uh, mesh network to radio network, which uh -huh. I think actually will be deal with the question. Uh, that would be great. I mean, no, I'm talking. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, uh, we, we've just not done it because we just started doing this. But I, and we're, yeah, I'm not saying we cannot be done. I mean, I we, think the yeah. question is much deeper. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, and because uh, I did have a question. Actually. Okay. Uh, the, uh, this is not my area, but uh, uh, initial internet management traffic was by you know users adjusting you know, with their probability distribution. You know, uh -huh. learning how many times they don't get served and. Exactly. With injection rather than the flow. So uh, why such a big switch now to, to flow? Um, so well, first, with the traffic, we did not want to deal it in a probabilistic manner. We wanted to deal it with a deterministic manner to give bounds. Um, most, so and along the same token, I can say that the approach we have followed is a direct extension of what Tim Rothgarden and all this group at Stanford has done on internet congestion. Um, why flow? But early, the Frank Kelly and that was very different way of saying. That was very different. Okay, so I guess the question you're asking is why did even the internet people change to flows? Right. Is that okay? Right. That is hard to say. I mean, in the sense, um, I can tell you why I do flows. 
because we try to maximize throughput. So I guess the, 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 the justification in the transportation world is fairly simple. And I can tell you why we don't do stochastic yet or expected value yet, though you could probably extend this extended value, but it's because we're trying to get uh, uh, tight bounds. Now, why the internet congestion management community switched from that first approach to what they're doing now? Uh, that is a good question that I don't know. Yes? So, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, we work with behavioral economists, but we have not yet worked on mechanism design and incentivization. So, in our setting, we are assuming that we are given a proportion alpha of people who actually will uh, comply without really caring too much of how that is achieved. So, um, in practice, you mean or? In theory, no, we have not, no. And again, that, that's mostly because so far we have handled this problem from a flow control perspective. I mean, it's really a nash stackelberg flow control approach. We have not handled it uh, from a mechanism design perspective. And this is something we're just starting. I mean, and I, I think, as you're rightfully saying, I, mean, I think there are several things that need to expand that work. I mean, uh, one of them is the dynamic aspect, because that's still static. And another one is the mechanism design, because it's absolutely not clear um, um, how to do that. And if you look further, there's even more because uh, these assumptions that people don't react over time is wrong. People will learn on a daily basis, and now you have you have several time scales. So uh, I've just scratched the surface here. I think, and and that's why I'm saying. I mean, the very first part of the talk was, you know, we've done it. It's implemented. It's in practice. Uh, this is going to probably take several years before something comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, so Jeff Shama says it's impossible to arrive at UCLA at 8 a.m. I think he's right. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, in other terms, do you have the possibility to explain, uh, I mean, as part of the work you've done, to explain to a driver that, you know, the variability in traffic and the entering queuing phenomena is so large that if things are congested, you can't predict when it's right. going to arrive. At the right. location. So assuming that you have people who are intelligent and understand probabilities, so not the people who watch Fox News, you could probably I said UCLA. I said UCLA. this UCLA, so they don't watch Fox News. You're yeah, right, uh, just like Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, I think the same same organization. So assuming assuming that uh, people can understand probabilities, the thing you could tell them is that, uh, and we have these curves. In fact, um, when you route people through stochastic networks, you can the best you can give them is a probability of on-time arrival within a certain margin. So these curves we have produced, and you can, so that assumes they understand that, that concept. Um, but, but, and they're UCLA. They're UCLA, so they understand, yeah. Um, uh, so, and I think that because these probability distribution are not bounded, they will also understand that we can't give you a guarantee. Um, so, so, th so the answer to that is yes. But it won't make Fox News, because there are probabilities. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Oh, and there's actually more, so, yeah. Well, yeah, not buses, not cars. But these have different characteristics. They don't congest in the same way, but they have finite capacity. And I wonder whether you could incorporate multimodal gasification methods. So there is a, there is a way to do it, which people who deal with HOV and HOT lanes have done before, is instead of counting vehicles, you count people, which you have to do anyway, because if you're doing bus and transit, now you have to do uh, people. But then, the, of course, the equation change. Um, it is a much tougher modeling problem. Um, I think smartphone gives an opportunity to track people individual by individual, as opposed to vehicle by vehicle. Uh, and it's not even something we have started to consider, but if you look at what people have done in Singapore again, I mean, I think they have shown that already when using the MRT, the um, uh, metro line, uh, you can start to have that count by people having participated in some incentivization programs with their phones. So if I had to make a guess of how that will be done, if that's ever done or when that will be done, I would assume that tying it to the identity and refining the models so that now they reflect the mode, uh, the carpooling, the nature, the bus nature, you could do it. And a lot of people in transportation do work on these models, but I'm not too familiar with what they look like. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Oh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll remind everyone we have a reception, which uh, is starting now, uh, upstairs in room 301. You can either take the stairs or the elevators uh, just outside to the third floor. J'avais profité pour, euh, pour bâcher Fox News parce que avec le debate, avec le debate. Euh. Which one did you pick? The, the